Mo friends, I'm back after a while and I'm bringing you a tight, comprehensive, sometimes incomprehensive video about full weathering on this giant Karl Mörder. Last time I've shown you how I painted the base colors, and now we'll use this post shaded base coat to its full potential. My tradition is to start with a pin wash, and there's plenty to choose from, but for this model I think I'll go with this one. Dark wash for green vehicles. I have one dedicated to Panzer Grey, but it's very cold and has more blue than brown mixed into it. So for the purposes of this model, a dark, warm tone is gonna be ideal. Synthetic brushes are best for this task because they won't get destroyed by enamel thinners. A few days ago I was visited by my modeling friend and we were talking about pin washes and how for him it's the most crucial step because an airbrushed model looks just so bland and if it wasn't for the pin wash he probably would never finish the model because you know it just looks so boring and uninspired to him. <laughs> On the opposite side there's me and how I'm always afraid the pin wash will completely nullify the airbrushed post shading. I think in the ideal world I would airbrush the model, paint the details, add tracks and consider it finished. But in most cases these two techniques complement each other perfectly. And there's something extra, something that the viewer will never see, but for you as an author it's one of the best things that can happen. You see when you're applying a pin wash, outlining and picking out every surface detail, something magical happens. You start getting familiar with the model's surface and you'll understand and memorize its shapes, curves and points of interest and that right there is huge, my friends. That's more important than knowing all the fancy techniques that are out there. Because when you understand the model, you'll know what to do and where to do it. On top of that, a wash, and it doesn't matter if it's enamel or oil, lets you add subtle staining and color variation in various key areas of the model. For example, a dark shadowed corner or a hatch above the engine compartment are both great candidates for some subtly feathered pin wash, as it both enhances the post shading and adds very faint traces of grime and dirt. These effects will guide you later on when you're adding more dedicated effects such as oil stains or darker earth tones. It's worth noting how a wash can visually darken the model, especially when it's filled with rivets, bolts and whatnot and it's something worth taking into account when you're airbrushing the model. For example, making it significantly lighter. Lastly, and this is more practical but worth mentioning nonetheless, you should let the wash become dry to the touch before you start blending, as it will offer you way more control over the result. If the wash was still wet, you'd be just absorbing it with a paintbrush and the result would be… inconsistent to say the least. Now when we look at the fully pin wash model, it's a noticeable difference. First off, as I said, it looks a bit darker, thanks to all those shadows we just added. But also, and that's more important, every detail was brought to life and we can enjoy these small surface features without having to search for them. And most importantly, the image of the finished model has become much clearer, at least to me, and we can confidently proceed with the next step. And by that I mean chipping. My favorite color for this task is Dark Rust because its tone works with every possible paint job I can imagine. Normally I lay down my acrylics on a wet palette, but chipping is the one exception. Here I still employ the metal palette and it's because of the strict mixing ratio that I use. In fact, it's the only ratio I follow in modeling. Every other color mixture I make is just guesstimated and it's 4 drops of paint, 2 drops of drying retarder and 1 drop of tap water. My trusty chipping paintbrush is this Vallejo Kolinsky triple zero. I use it for chipping and figure painting, that's basically it. Although the model surface has become much easier to read, I was still a bit lost when trying to figure out the right amount and layout of the chipping effects. 
I didn't want to over chip the model, so I ultimately decided to start in those areas where most wear would be present. Performing a high octane chipping action on this model would have been pointless because A, it's a huge model and I'd be condemning myself to more than 100 hours of fine brush painting, and B, the Carlo Mordor wasn't a frontline tank, it was a highly valuable limited production artillery piece that operated 10 kilometers behind the front line. And dare I say, its operation was quite limited. Thus, it was clear to me that this model would need a very subtle approach, and most of the interesting effects would have to be created with the basic paint job, which I've already done. Everything else that follows will just work as an accessory, basically refining the overall look of the model. But then again, this mindset was in a heated conflict with my other side, the one which likes to use chipping effects as a way to make the model more visually striking. Because you can use this technique to draw the viewer's attention, add contrast between individual panels and components, outline details in a similar way as a pin wash does, and most importantly, give the model a heavy metal look. That's, however, achieved with multiple techniques working together, and chipping is only one part of the equation. I also adjusted the amount of wear depending on what part I was chipping. The exposed edges and handrails on the hull are far more chipped than the mortar assembly. Or the inside of the hull is completely pristine compared to the outer surfaces. And one more thing. My standard approach is to apply two layer chipping. The first one is made from light chips and the second from dark ones. This gives you a vibrant, three-dimensional effect that's easy to spot. However, it takes so much time. I tried skipping the light chips on my previous model, the Toyota Land Cruiser, and the finished model didn't suffer one bit from it. The important thing is to have a reasonably light base coat, which will make the chips easily visible. Conversely, a shadowed part of the model will make the chips harder to spot, and they won't stand out like a sore thumb in those places. You're basically able to create a light gradient in the chipping layer, and that's pretty cool if you ask me. However, chipping is only partially finished without rust effects, and for that we need to switch to enamels. This goes straight against what I just said about a highly valuable, very expensive artillery weapon with limited use, because no one, especially not Germans, would allow it to become rusty. But hear me out, or you know what? First of all, I don't have to make excuses or explain anything. It's my model and I'll paint it the way I want, alright? And you do the same, and let no one tell you otherwise. So now that we have moral questions out of the way, let's geek out. Rust is awesome, and it's become a part of my style because it's usually the first effect that adds a splash of a completely different color to the model. A good portion of armored vehicles are either green, grey, some greenish brown, sand or whatever, they're just not colorful, okay? And this is usually the first time when we introduce some additional color, and it's a pretty striking one. It also does a little bit of magic because it blends the chipping into the surface, but not too much, not at all. It's a subtle, smooth transition between what's supposed to be paint and exposed steel. It's also the second step in the grand scheme of making a model look heavy, metal, and heavy metal. I'm actually counting these points on my hand, but obviously you can't see it. However, um, number three, or four, um, it gets toned down, okay? Earth tones usually cover a large portion of these fine effects, so the final result gets evened out, so to say. And if you want to enjoy all these effects together, it's not a bad idea to go slightly overboard. And so what was the last one? Um, right, rust is fun, okay? Anything that makes you spend more good time on your model is cool, and if it makes the model look more interesting, even better. But when we take a step back and look at the model from a normal viewing distance, the effect becomes very subtle, doesn't it? It's almost as if it wasn't even there, but when you look closer, you'll start to recognize signs of wear. But all this chipping wouldn't be complete without some silver. 
silver acrylic paint on an armor model. Where would one use that? Naturally, on all those welds that we meticulously sculpted during the construction phase. Welds, unlike regular steel, don't rust, or at least not as quickly. And that just means more awesome contrast and visual interest for us. It's another area filled with the satisfying moments when you first bring out their texture with pin washes and then highlight them with shiny, subtle chipping. Everyone wins in this situation. And just like that, we're halfway there, my friends. It might not look like it, but these techniques took a lot of time. Two weeks, in fact. Minus the weekends. The point of this allegory is that it's a huge model and it takes time to do even the most basic techniques. It's like painting multiple models at once, that's how much surface you have to work with here. Anyway, let's move on with detail painting and for this I very much prefer the wet palette because I tend to work with all kinds of acrylics and their consistency isn't that important. What I'll need are basically a few random shades of light grey to bring out the details and to paint steel surfaces, and some black, brown and wood colors to paint… you guessed it… wood. <laughs> it's not gonna be all about acrylics though, but I'll mention the enamel paints as we move forward. I'll start with the engineering tools on the back of the hull, because these are gonna add another hint of color. I didn't base coat them with black brown in the past, but it's a trick I learned from figure painting, and it makes the result look much better. Basically, if you have a very dark undercoat, it'll show through as a fake shadow if you miss some area with the actual top paint, and it also influences some of them, but we'll get to that. For these steel surfaces, two layers of light grays work well enough. Now we can hit them with enamel rust washes. These, however, have to be very subtle, so you can still see the grey steel tones. And unlike chipping effects, here I also like to employ the light rust wash, as it gives the large metal surface a more lively and interesting look. As with everything, visually striking is the keyword here. And what's awesome is once they're dry to the touch, we can layer additional acrylics on top of them. For example, if we want to tone down some of the rust in certain places. Or we can darken the edges a little using that black-brown acrylic paint. There are so many ways and all of them are fun. Next up are the wooden handles. And here's where the dark paint underneath makes the biggest difference. I used to paint the handles with a thick layer of old wood and then add the wood grain using Iraqi sand. But if you apply old wood in an uneven layer over black-brown, the resulting texture will have even more visual depth. And you can easily fake some shadows around tool clamps, making them stand out more without using enamels or oils. So yeah, that's our tool department out of the way, and I'm so glad that I replaced those ugly plastic clamps with photo etched ones, because this detail stands out a lot on this model. And while I had those wooden colors on the paintbrush, I quickly treated the wooden planks on the deck. These seem to be quite improvised on the real vehicle and they do a great job of breaking that grey metal surface with some warm wooden tones. Next up are the extended exhaust pipes. The large mufflers are totally hidden under the walkways, a total shame if you ask me, but luckily we have these and they're nicely visible. My process here was basically the same as with those tools. A mottled grey base coat, but I added some dark chipping as well. This doesn't really represent exposed steel like on the rest of the model, but rather the darkest rust tones. Actually, now that I think about it, painting corroded surfaces in this way is like taking monochrome pictures through colored filters, right? Basically, you lay down the basic textures and volumes with acrylics, and then you add a thick layer of rust effects on top of that. Varying the intensity and the color is also important if we want to have a nice, colorful, happy exhaust. I can use an airbrush here to speed up the drying process to show you the difference. And I mean, see, it's quite magical, right? More texture and randomness can be added with speckling. And here I used a simple paper mask so I wouldn't speckle the entire model. And those few stains behind the exhaust can be quickly wiped off with a bit of thinner. But yeah. This is very simple and the result makes a huge difference. 
Then we have additional metal surfaces on this model, but these have to be shiny. Well, not too shiny, and for that I like using the liquid metal pigment from VMS. Just like those rust effects, it depends on what color you have underneath, and because my goal was a dark steel surface that's being slightly polished by friction, I chose a dark brown chipping color as the undercoat. Then you just have to wait for the enamel binder to evaporate and you'll end up with a nice metallic effect. These pistons have to be shiny as well, but now we're talking super shiny, like chrome level shiny. I'm no chrome expert because I encounter this type of surface on armor models once in a million years, but when I do, it's always hydraulic pistons. And for those, I have a sheet of self-adhesive chrome foil that used to be sold by a local modeling club. It's not as fun as painting the surface with a paintbrush, but it's the result that's important here. Cutting tape means measuring the length of the piston and also its diameter, and then using complicated astrophysics to calculate its circumference. The only downside is that there will be a visible joint where the tape meets, but if it can be hidden somewhere out of sight, it's gonna be like it was never there in the first place. Also, the tape is quite fragile and I sometimes have to fix it with a bit of super glue because the adhesive is not the strongest. But it gets the job done and that's what counts in the end. The final step in the detailing process is picking out and highlighting everything that's small. Sometimes the details are just so tiny, you know, and sometimes they become darker because of the pin wash, and sometimes they're just not so well defined and it's hard to even outline them with the wash, right? And for all of these situations, a color that's lighter than the base coat is gonna bring them to life. This is undoubtedly the most controversial method of the bunch. Even I, although it's one of my favorite techniques, often cringe when I watch the process in real time. But it does two things that make the model look better. First off, remember how I said that a pin wash can visually darken the surface if it's full of rivets? Then this technique brings some of that lightness back, because those rivets are not gonna be so dark anymore. And more importantly, if maximum sharpness and detail definition is your objective, then this is the technique for you. It's like taking an HDR picture because you're really capturing the whole range from the darkest shadows to the brightest highlights and everything on the model pops. And once again, if we look at the model as a whole, none of these effects are as striking as they were in those close-ups. Whenever you have doubts about how balanced your finishes are, just Lean back in your chair and observe the entire model for a while. I agree that some details are exaggerated, especially on the front end of the hull, but it's all part of a plan, trust me on that. <laughs> Let's finally start the weathering process and get the tracks ready. Because I bought metal tracks from Master Club, I can use their material to my advantage and treat them with VMS Black Track Pro. It's a corrosive chemical, so you better not dip your hands in there and keep it away from your airbrush, or at the very least, the aluminum palette. There's a bit of real life experience behind that statement. The blackening process is pretty fast, but there are always air bubbles in the tracks, and these have to be removed manually one by one. Rubbing with a toothbrush doesn't always work, so my next best solution is popping them with a toothpick. Once you're done with the process, you must wash them in soapy water to stop the chemical reaction, and the result is some next level stuff. If you need this or some other magic potions from VMS, you can snatch them at mishtoy.com, and if you're a registered user and use the promo code BOOKFRIENDS2023, you'll get a whopping 15% discount on everything. But that's not everything, and now I'm gonna hit them with AK Texture Paste. The rusty and partially dusty patina created by the chemical reaction is an awesome undercoat for additional effects. I like my tracks when they have some earthy texture, but not on those contact points, those need to stay clean, okay? And again, once it dries, it kinda looks the part, doesn't it? Even though we're concerned about texture only at the moment, not the actual color. So moving on, let's add the same horribleness to the lower hull as well. Very little of this is gonna be visible in the end, so I wasn't really concerned about blending at all. I just carefully stippled it, left it to dry, and everything else will be done with paints. 
Here I'd like to show you how dirty a Carl murder could be. See how muddy the lower hull is? It's pretty cool. And don't get me started on the camouflage that was made with mud on this one. I actually considered it for a moment, but nah, I'd probably have a breakdown somewhere down the road. Okay, so pre-dusting with my favorite Tommy above color. As usual, the paint has to be reasonably thin. And it's my tradition to not care about mixing ratios. Except when it comes to the chipping color, that's the only exception. So pre-dusting is another super sweet technique because it does a couple of things and it does them spectacularly. First thing, it efficiently blends the transition between the stippled mud paste and the clean surfaces. All of a sudden, your mud layers look much nicer. You can actually do a little bit of post shading on the dark mud as well. And second, we all know how it's often hard to create thick, opaque yet smooth layers of dust or mud using enamels. When you're blending them, they just keep moving around and it's hard to build up the opacity. That's done with pre-dusting here because you can slowly build that paint coverage, but once it's there, it's there to stay. So we can be sure that these areas will remain dusty or covered with dry mud, depending on the texture. You can then use enamels to further refine and modify the effect and make it grittier and more natural looking. This is also a good time to get those polished contact points on tracks clean. These are some giant cleats and having them completely shiny would have been a bit boring, so I opted for this partially polished, heavily worn and scratched surface that has more visual texture and lots of contrast. The same thing was done on the guide horns, and this is one of the biggest advantages of metal tracks. It's so easy and the results always beat plastic tracks painted with some metallic shiny color. Now we can finally switch to those enamels, and I'm only gonna need three tones on the entire model and their use is gonna be quite restrained. Most of the work was already done with the acrylic paste and pre-dusting, so all I wanted to do now was to add some of that random, greedy, natural texture. Speckling is ideal for this, and tracks are the best starting point because you can be very heavy-handed here. I just made sure to blend it on those polished areas. The paint leaves a faint, dusty residue which tones down the shiny surface down a notch, which is honestly very nice. The darker tone doesn't necessarily represent mud or damp earth, it's just there for some color variation. Even dry earth can, and often has, various lighter and darker tones. Wheels are very similar because they tend to get dirty a lot, but here I always like to practice some caution. But the process becomes easier because I already have the hang of the technique from those tracks, so the intensity and size of the specs becomes more controllable. But here it's not just about speckling anymore. There are nice surface details that allow us to add some contrast here and there. Basically a subtle, random earth wash. The only thing that's left is the polished metal surface on the inside. And here I like to use a graphite stick or a soft pencil, as it's more controllable than sandpaper. And it also creates a much darker, yet still very shiny effect. Sometimes it tends to skip over the surface and it needs to be spread more evenly. A rubber sculpting brush is the best tool for the job, and as a side effect, it makes the surface even shinier. Graphite powder can be also used to polish the wheels, and for this, you don't have to use fancy tools. Even your fingers will do the job if you have some. Personally, I don't like painting steel wheels. I just find the rubber ones more exciting because you can play more with the earth effects and create some nice contrast on the rubber portions. But hey, now that every component is done, I can assemble the running gear. Note how I quickly added the same enamel treatment on the lower hull and how little of it will be visible in the end. Having the tracks and wheels in place is extremely helpful because you'll get a more compact idea about the finished model, and if you don't have any clear references for weathering, it'll help you decide how to proceed further. Or you could leave it like this, I mean, it doesn't look bad. But I personally like a more balanced and at the same time grittier finish. So I repeated the same pre-dusting procedure on the upper hull and the mortar, focusing most of the dust on the walkways. I tried to create a smooth gradient of sorts from the bottom up, dirty running gear and lower hull, and mostly clean mortar pointing towards the sky. 
Enamel weathering was the same thing, but it also kinda wasn't. <laughs> it wasn't easy to strike a balance between visible layers of dirt and the overall subtlety of the effect. In many cases, the natural deposits of dirt go right against my pose shading. For example, the shadowed areas that I created, those are mostly covered in dust. So ultimately, I had to keep it subtle if I wanted some of the pose shading visible. And I also had to employ some artistic trickery to color grade dust as well. You might have noticed that I didn't use pin washes to bring out the perforated metal on the walkways, because that would lead to a very unnatural and plain ugly dark finish. I made that mistake when I was a teenager and it's probably one of the reasons why I never finished that model. Instead, my plan was to bring it out with earth tones and some polishing. As I said, artistic trickery is when you go against logic and do something unnatural on purpose. Using a darker earth tone in specific areas helped me to keep the contrast. For example, outlining various details and weld beads, or just creating those plain, simple color gradients. You can do it without waiting for the first layer to dry, but your blending has to be very delicate and careful. Speckling diluted paint is another cool way to add more randomness and that nice, gritty texture that I keep talking about. It doesn't always have to represent splashes of mud, and it all comes down to how intense the effect is. Here's another example of adding contrast and fake shadows using earth tones. But generally speaking, tight and shadowed areas such as this are prone to some moisture, even when the ground is dry. So on one hand, you've got a bit of artistic license and on the other, a bit of realism to balance things out. But it doesn't have to be used exclusively for contrast, okay? Note how the darker paint changes the color of the light dust, making it look warmer and less intense. We have so many options for achieving balance in our finishes, and it's up to each individual to try and see what method works best for them. I think the most exciting part about vehicles in dry environments is how you can still make the most out of the dusty finish, and this applies to desert vehicles as well. After all, when I was weathering my CRN T55 and T90, I did the same thing. Multiple layers of earth tones blended on top of each other for a more interesting finish. Earth effects have one downside though. They often flow into places where they shouldn't be, where they have no business being in, and this generally means deep panel lines and gaps between parts, mostly hatches and engine panels, or in this case, the walkways made from individual sheets. Many modelers forget about this, and then their dusty finishes are a bit bland, but a quick round of the same pin wash that we started with is gonna make things a lot better. And finally, polishing with graphite. It doesn't just bring out the texture on the walkways, which was my plan from the get-go, but I also rubbed it over pretty much every worn edge on the model, enhancing that heavy metal look. It's a multiple stage process, remember? Chipping, rust zones, and finally polishing with graphite. And with that, I kinda finished the model without even realizing it. Well, almost, because it needs a small scenic base. But that's a story for the next video, my friends. Also, a small scenic base is a relative term, because no matter how tight I make the base around the model, it's still gonna be huge. I also want to add a figure or two to give the scene a bit of life, but more importantly, show how giant the mortar was in real life. I mean, you could fit an adult person inside the barrel, but it's hard to visualize that when you only have the model without any human elements. And yeah, okay, so let's talk about the weathering a little more. Uh, I had my suspicions about why this model isn't such a popular modeling subject despite how famous the vehicle is. I mean, you could show a photo of the Mordor to any modeler or World War II enthusiast and they would at the very least know that something like this existed. Yet nobody seems to be building them. Well, my suspicions from the last video were confirmed and I'm quite sure it's because of how complex and large it is. It just takes a lot of time and dedication to finish it and if you want to finish it to a slightly higher standard, you know, with some basic weathering techniques, not just a plain paint job, 
well, then even the most basic technique is gonna take a while. For example, the pin washing took me 5 days and I was working on it anywhere between 5 to 8 hours a day. So yeah, that's worth considering if you'd like to build one of those yourself. It's definitely gonna be a demanding model and you should be ready for that. Okay, so now for the next video. Um, I'll make a firing range vignette for it, uh, paint some figure or figures, hopefully, and conclude this giant project with that. I don't know if I'll manage to finish the scene comfortably in a week and if the video will be ready the next Friday or the Friday after that, but you can be sure it'll be here for you as soon as it's ready. Until then, I want to say thank you for watching, my friends, and a special thanks goes to my wonderful patrons who make this show possible. If you like what I'm doing and want to get more of it, and in return support my work, you can go to my Patreon page and see what kind of reward would you like. I'm posting there almost every day with updates from my workbench, we can get in touch through DMs, comments and emails, I'm posting one week early ad free videos, I also have some small 3D models for detailing your own projects, a bunch of references from the real world if you need inspiration for old buildings, landscapes and so on, so something interesting for dioramas, and last but not least, these beautiful studio photos which you can download in full resolution. Alright, dear friends, dreams models aside, I'm glad this thing is painted, weathered and basically finished. Painting giant models isn't really my cup of tea, as I would rather enjoy three smaller models that are not as demanding and each can be finished in its own unique way. But on the other hand, I'm still glad I gave this model a shot and that it's gonna be a part of my collection now. Anyway, yeah, so I'll see you in the next one with the scenic base, okay? <laughs> Cheers!